we had some issues brought up on the issue of homosexuality. Okay? So let me talk about that a little bit. Here we had a uh, fellow, he says, there are selective pressures for the males too, and when those change, you get consequences. In the case of dimorphism, as it uh, related to competition between the genders, keep in mind that men uh, are no longer fighting to survive against enemies in hand-to-hand -hand combat or predators and animals in the wild. Okay, thank you. Uh, assuming those were pressures that contributed to the evolution of strength and power in males, when those pressures are gone, you're likely to end up with softer men <laughs> that don't even have good coordination or aggressiveness. Okay, this alone might allow women to catch up. Okay, uh, so I guess it's an arms race, and when uh, there is no race because you don't have to fight against the element, um, I guess that's what he's saying then uh, there is no reason for women not to catch up to men. I don't know if everybody agrees with that, but uh, I guess that's one point of view. Okay, okay here's another fellow. He talks about testosterone, whether you need it or not to, <laughs> to overcome or overpower women. Okay, says, I think I read a theory at some point about uh, less testosterone leading to less conflict. Uh -huh. I wonder how the level of testosterone in modern men compared to hundreds of thousands of years ago. Again, an issue of evolution and whether we developed more and more, uh, or, or at least we used a lot of testosterone in the past because of different uh, environment that we were in, and that we don't need that anymore today because we don't have to fight against the element. We, we are the kings of the mountain, so to speak, right? We have nothing to fear. Okay, okay another fellow says, if I can get him up here, says, all human embryos uh, start the same, kind of as women but then eventually the gonads or something else starts making testosterone and other, other androgens, and this leads to major changes not only in the reproductive organs, but the whole brain wiring. Uh -huh. I suppose that the more testosterone at that stage, the more wiring gets altered. Uh, yeah, uh, the question is whether testosterone is the deciding factor. Okay? Whether if, uh, if you have more estrogen or more testosterone, does that make any difference? I mean, you have, again, women who have uh, primarily, obviously, estrogen, and, you know, they get in the ring, they can beat up some men out there. So, I mean, I'm not sure that's got any, as much to do with testosterone and estrogen as it has to do with skill and strength and so on. And you will find females which are pretty strong, and they have estrogen. So, I don't know. Uh, the jury's still out on that one. That, I guess, was the main point that I was trying to make last time, whether estrogen and testosterone really have anything to do with strength. Remember that uh, in the animal kingdom in general, you know, females have estrogen and uh, males have uh, testosterone, but uh, uh, again, there's, it's the social factor, the, fa the, the roles that each uh, member of the like, uh, lion clan or the hyena clan have that maybe decides who has what skills and not so much the uh, chemical composition inside the body. Now the fellow says, says uh, I think it's a combination of both. Uh -huh. And he was talking about whether it's nature or nurture. Okay? Uh, don't know if it's more nature or nurture though. I believe straightness is the standard simply because it's what works to keep the species going. Not because sex feels good or any of those, those are secondary, he says, right, reasons, but it is mainly because it's simply practical. Uh -huh. All homosexual people, they like it or not, come from straight human relationships. There are physically no other ways. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, homosexuals obviously come from uh, heterosexual couples. Uh, I don't think you can get them from homosexual uh, couples. And, um, but then the question is how much... Uh, nature and how much nurture there is and if there's any nurture at all. Uh, I can only give you my five cents worth and that's um, that I think people are born gay. I don't think they are educated to be gay. I don't think you can undo what you have inside you. And just like heterosexual people don't fall in love with their own uh, types, I don't think in, in the same way that a homosexual can change his orientation. He's born with it. I think he's hardwired that way. And again, I showed uh, last time that um, there's several studies, uh, one by this fellow Swab, and he's uh, Dutch. And what he did, he uh, took some brains and dead people, and he looked at the sizes of the uh, uh, that uh, dimorphism uh, 
uh, I can't remember what it was, the uh, gland or whatever, and he found that there were differences between uh, homosexuals and uh, heterosexual men. Okay? So I think there is a physical difference between them, and that's something, you, if you're going to be do, looking at this subject, you, you should do some research on that. Uh, I also read uh, in the past a couple papers that sheep also have that issue where uh, the uh, males that are uh, homosexual, you know, they put like 10 sheep in a row and have them there in, in their stalls, and here comes, the, they bring the sheep they suspect of being homosexual. Well, they bring several sheep, but they, they figured out that the ones that always, you know, they can smell all, all the sheep there and they go after the males, and those are the homosexual ones. And approximately 10% of sheep are uh, deemed to be homosexual. And when they look at the brains of these sheep, more or less like uh, what Swab uh, found there, that, um, uh, you know, the brains have differences. So it's up for you to ponder if you're going to be doing research on the subject. Okay, uh, I still I hope I'm still alive here. <laughs> uh, I still I'm getting uh, that they're not receiving uh, enough uh, streaming at YouTube. Can everybody hear me? Can anyone confirm that for me? Okay, because uh, I just got a yellow uh, sign there from uh, YouTube. Again, I'm in South America. I'm hope I'm hoping everybody can hear me still. Yeah. Okay. I don't know. I don't know why I got that message from YouTube. Okay, so please bear with me. I'm worried about being, you know, losing contact. Anyways, final issue. Uh, here it is. Um, fellow says, what about human survival through mealworms? He's talking about the extinction of man. And he says, we, mealworms can eat just about anything and we can eat mealworms. Uh -huh. And if you look up what is a mealworm, what's the larvae uh, form of the mealworm beetle? What is he talking about? He's talking about maggots. <laughs> That's what he's talking about, whether they're flies or... Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the confirmation. Anyways, uh, you know, are we going to be eating maggots? That's the first issue. The second issue is that, you know, if you look up mealworms, the, they, uh, they uh, you know, they can eat apples, they can eat stuff like that, but the question is whether they can eat some weeds that nobody wants. You know, so the diet of the, of the worms is one issue. Then the other one is, what are you going to have, a, uh, a farm, a, a maggot farm? Just grow maggots and eat them? Is that what it is? You know, I don't know if that's much of a future. Uh, it might help you survive your group or you, but it's not going to last uh, several generations. So even if we survive or some pockets of humans survive eating mealworms or any kind of maggot, uh, I don't think it's got very much of a future.